So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli ameen ya Rabbi. Today I want to discuss a philosopher of the early, you know, the, the late 19th century from the 1970s. Uh, his name was Milton Friedman. He was a major economist who believed in certain ideas that we're going to talk about. And we're going to talk about how capitalism, how capitalism leads to the destruction of human freedom. And to do to understand this, we're going to first go to Harvard University, and we're going to listen to a Harvard University professor talk about Milton Friedman's idea of property ownership and his ideas of basically, look, if I own myself, then no one has a right to tax me. And if I own myself, then the government should not have control over me. And so this type of libertarianism is what it's usually called. This type of libertarianism, who are the people who believe in these ideas even today? And who are the, and, and what, how does this affect uh, society? So how capitalism, and you can say pure capitalism, how pure capitalism leads to the breaking down of freedoms in any given society. So we're going to study this uh, based upon the works of or the idea of Milton Friedman, which he actually borrows from Jeremy Bentham and others. Um, but having said that, let's go to Harvard University. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want to put the ideas that people celebrate in the universities. And, you know, these professors, they're looked at as prophets. And I want to show you what their ideas are. And what they said 30, 40 years ago, and what is happening today, okay? And by doing this, I'm hoping by putting these uh, ideas uh, under the microscope, you will be able to better appreciate the teachings of Islam, okay? So, you know, it's one thing to know things in from a secondary perspective. But if I take you to Harvard University, then you are going to yourself experience, okay, this is what they say. These are the ideas. And now we can see what is going to what is really happening. Okay. So, uh, because we need Muslims who are able to take uh, some of these uh, ideas of the modern times and to see what has happened, what has become of them, what has been the result of them. So, let us, inshallah, continue. I want to go back to the arguments for and against the redistribution of income. But before we do that, just one word about the minimal state. Milton Friedman, a libertarian <laughs> economist, he points out that many of the functions that we take for granted as properly belonging to government don't. They are paternalist. One example he gives is social security. He says it's a good idea for people to save for their retirement during their earning years. So just so you understand, what he's saying here is, look, the government doesn't need to be a parent, which, you know, and Islam, we also agree with the idea of small government or as small as a government as as possible but here they mean it from a different perspective and so the idea is that why should government give social security and retirement money or pension to people that have retired why should the government do that it's not the job of the government to do that so this is and, and this stems from the idea of look I own myself I have to take care of myself no one has the right to force me to give tax because you have to understand social security is given and the idea is to pay Social Security, meaning the people that are in retirement to pay them, you have to tax the people so that the older people can be paid. And the idea is that why I own myself, and if I own myself, and just think about this idea, astaghfirullah, right? Uh, I own myself, so then why should somebody force me to pay taxes? And who are the most for this type of ideas? We will talk about that in a second. But now continue to listen. But it's wrong, it's a violation of people's liberty for the government to force everyone, whether they want to or not, to put aside some earnings today 
for the sake of their retirement. If people want to take the chance, or if people want to live big today and live a, a, a poor retirement, that should be their choice. They should be free to make those judgments and take those risks. So even Social Security would still be at odds with the minimal state that Milton Friedman argued for. It's sometimes thought that collective goods like police protection and fire protection <coughs> will inevitably create the problem of free riders unless they're publicly provided. But there are ways to prevent free riders. There are ways to restrict even seemingly collective goods like fire protection. I read an article a while back about a private fire company, the Salem Fire Corporation in Arkansas. You can sign up with the Salem Fire Corporation, pay a yearly subscription fee, and if your house catches on fire, they will come and put out the fire. But they won't put out everybody's fire. They will only put it out if it's a fire in the home of a subscriber or if it starts to spread and to threaten the home of a subscriber. The newspaper article told the story of a homeowner who had subscribed to this company in the past but failed to renew his subscription. His house caught on fire. The Salem Fire Corporation showed up with its trucks and watched the house burn, just making sure that it didn't spread. The fire chief was asked, well, he wasn't exactly the fire chief. I guess he was the CEO. <laughs> he was asked, how can you stand by with fire equipment and allow a person's home to burn? He replied, once we verified there was no danger to a member's property, we had no choice but to back off according to our rules. If we responded to all fires, he said, there would be no incentive to subscribe. The homeowner, in this case, tried to renew his subscription at the scene of the fire, but the head of the company refused. You can't wreck your car, he said, and then buy insurance for it later. So even public goods that we take for granted as being within the proper province of government can, many of them, in principle, be isolated, made exclusive to those who pay. That's all to do with the question of collective goods and the libertarians' injunction against paternalism. But let's go back now to the arguments about redistribution. Now, underlying the libertarian's case for the minimal state. Now here, when we're talking about redistribution of wealth, because I own myself, I own my money, I own my labor, I own my property, no one has the right to tell me I need to pay taxes, or for that matter, even a poor person. It's good if I help a poor person, but no one should force me. No one should force me to help a poor person. So just keep this in mind. Is a worry about coercion, but what's wrong with coercion? The libertarian offers this answer. <clears throat> to coerce someone, to use some person for the sake of the general welfare, is wrong because it calls into question the fundamental fact that we own ourselves, the fundamental moral fact of self-possession or self-ownership. The libertarian's argument against redistribution begins with this fundamental idea that we own ourselves. Nozick says that if the society as a whole can go to Bill Gates or go to Michael Jordan and tax away a portion of their wealth. What the society is really asserting is a collective property right in Bill Gates or in Michael Jordan. But that violates the fundamental principle that we belong to ourselves. Now, we've already heard a number of, of objections.
to the libertarian argument. What I would like to do today is to give the libertarians among us a chance to answer the objections that have been raised. And some have been, some have already identified themselves. And have so there's no need to uh, go further. So you get the idea, right? We own ourselves, so therefore no one has the right to force us to give charity, to pay taxes. And this is to the benefit of those people who believe in small government. Why do they want small government? Because they feel government takes away their liberties. Why do they feel government takes away their liberties? Because the particularly, and I'm just giving the answer here a little bit, the rich feel, well, you know, we have to give money to the poor and we have to help give these people pension and we have to, you know, pay taxes for the fire department and so on and so forth. So what has happened in his, now this was the idea in the 19, proposed in the 1970s. Okay, so now let's look at what happened. So this was the book written by uh, uh, Milton Friedman, okay, Capitalism and Freedom, in which he made many of these arguments that we are talking about right now. That I own myself; no one has the right to tell me what to do. This is the best. This is the best economy. This will create the best economy because this will force people to work. This will force you know people to compete, and then the. Consumers will make the best choices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is the best idea. No one should force anyone to do anything, especially in economics, especially in property rights, especially in my money and in my labor and my work and my property and my businesses. No one should be telling me what to do. Okay? If my business grows, then that's great. I'll hire more people. And if I'm paying taxes, I can't hire that many people. So you get, you get the idea, right? So this book was written in the 1970s, I believe, okay? Then what happened? Now, R Rob Larson has written a book now, uh, looking back 40 years into what has happened, okay? Capitalism versus freedom, the toll road to serfdom. Capitalism is the pathway to becoming slaves. Capitalism, this very idea that we are talking about, I own myself, therefore no one should force me, because this was an idea that was out there, What, especially because a lot of the big businesses then started, you know, doing things that gave them more and more, capitalism gave the big companies more and more control, and more and more control over the government, and tried to uh, move the government in a way to their advantage and to do away with like regulations especially the banks try to do this and we'll talk in a little bit more detail about this okay in a second capitalism versus freedom the toll road to serfdom this was the result after what 40 years after milton friedman the great economist which we'll discuss in a second after his ideas at the after 40 years for years it says we've been taught that capitalism is good for freedom. Dominant right-wing talk radio hosts to this day recommend libertarian classics like Hayek's Road to Serfdom and Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom that claim markets free us. And this picture still dominates the schools and the political spectrum. Well, get bent 1% because Rob Larson's capital, Capitalism versus Freedom, the Toll to Serfdom, puts big business under a microscope. This book debunks the conservative classics while demonstrating that the marketplace has its own great centers of power. Now remember that. The marketplace has its own great centers of power, which the libertarian tradition itself claims is a limit to freedom. In fact, Larson illustrates how capitalism fails both this and other concepts of human liberty, not just failing to establish a right to a share of society's production, but also leaving us subject to a great power, uh, to the great power plays of 1% of, of 1% corporate property. Okay, so these ideas, we own ourselves, we don't have to, and this will help businesses grow. Now the businesses have become so strong that they've taken away from us the, the quote unquote life, liberty and pursuit of happiness. It's taking it away. 
and it's all being taken away by the one percent okay let's just continue so libertarians what are who are they support maximum liberty in both personal and economic matters who does this benefit government should not do anything like charity or zakat nope let the big businesses become bigger and they'll hire more people, for example. This is what the idea is. Libertarians support maximum liberty in both personal and economic matters. They advocate as much smaller government. Government should be small, businesses should be big. Businesses become international, government should be small. Even though Islam is also for small government, meaning the government of an Islamic state has limited scope of what it can do and can't do. But the intent of that small government is different. Over here, the intent is let not to have a government that can regulate businesses, that can regulate, redistribute money and wealth. They don't want that. They don't want you to say, hey, you have to give some money so we can help the poor, the poor people of society. They advocate a much smaller government. One that is limited by protecting individuals from coercion and violence. Libertarians tend to embrace individual responsibility, oppose government bureaucracy and taxes, promote private charity. Privately, you can give charity. Tolerate diverse lifestyles, support the free market, and defend civil liberties. Okay. So, let's see. How much of this I'm going to read? Uh, let's just read... A part of this okay capitalism versus freedom this is a synapsis of that book you can say um being run by business american culture suffers from an overwhelming preponderance of stupidity when a set of institutions as reactionary as big business has a virtual monopoly over government and media let me repeat that. Big business has a virtual monopoly over government and the media. The kinds of information, entertainment, commentary, ideologies, educational policies on offer will not conduce to rationality or social understanding. What you'll end up with, for instance, an electorate of 25% of whose members are inclined to libertarianism, meaning 25% voters in America are inclined to this type of thought that the government should have no role, should not help the poor, should not have, you know, any services to help people that need anything, there should be no welfare state, etc., etc. And the number is even higher among young people. That is to say, huge numbers of people will, ex will be exposed to and per persuaded by the propaganda of Cato Institute, the magazine Reason, Ayn Rand's novels, and Milton Friedman's ideological hackery to express their rebellious and anti-authoritarian impulses by becoming extreme advocates of total tyranny to quote noam chomsky they'll believe as he translates power ought to be given into the hands of private unaccountable tyrannies namely corporations they'll think that if you just let government out of the picture this is what they teach you if you just let government not be involved if you just put the government out of the picture and let capitalism operate freely unencumbered by regulations or oversight or labor unions america used to have great labor unions like teamsters now no one speaks for the labor workers there's no more unions all will be for the best in in this best of all possible worlds and they will generally believe they and they'll genuinely genuinely believe they're being subversive and uh and in an arc anarchist by proposing such a program the spectacle of millions adhering to such a breathtakingly stupid ideology would be comical if it weren't so tragic i'm an atheist he says but Christianity strikes to me as more logical and moral religion than this libertarian, total totalitarianism. One of the absolute of faith in universal privatization, marketization, cooperation, commoditization, to be so-called libertarian is to be deplorably ignorant of modern history, economics, common sense, sociology, human psychology, and morality itself. Regarding morality, if, if the golden rule is an essential maximum, 
Then the communist slogan, there was a communist slogan that was basically from each according to his ability. If somebody can be a doctor, we'll let him do the doctor work. If somebody is a labor worker, let him be strong, let him be a labor worker. So from each according to his ability to each according to his need. So, so ca communism believed in giving people according to their need and people work according to their ability. And so when, no matter, you know, there would be, everybody would be made equal. Okay, everyone would get the same salary about, everyone would get the same things, the same needs are provided, so on and so forth. I'm not going to talk about communism right now, which is basically a derivative of the golden rule. Golden rule is do unto others as you would like them, have them to do to you. It's fundamental to any humane social organization. Greed and social Darwinism. Every man for himself, I own myself, this is the idea, every man for himself, are hardly morally luminous principles. Given this reactionary philosophy, intellectuals, sterility, meaning it's sterile, has no, uh, and the fact that it's been refuted countless times is tempting to simply ignore it. And most leftists do ignore it. But it's a mistake. As frightening figure quoted a, a moment ago, 25% of electoral, electoral uh, people that vote, okay? electorate indicates it's necessary to challenge free market worship whenever and wherever possible okay and so you get the idea okay that when you say oh i don't own anyone no i own myself these are ideas that help the rich become richer government should not interfere with us Government should not try to take our money and tax us and give money to the poor or to educational facilities. No. Okay. So this will become more clear why I'm talking about this in a little bit. Now, something very interesting. Actually, I'm not going to read this. I'm going to explain this to you as best as I can without reading this. See, what happens is you would think there are different types of intelligence. One of the most primary types of intelligence is the, is the ability to understand other people, to empathize with other people. The Prophet would, you know, he, you would have, if somebody is sick or they're hurt, you feel what they're feeling. But what happens is that when you have certain ideas, Actually, let's uh, go to this article a little bit. So, let's see if I can put this down. Research shows, so he's talking about different types of intelligence, okay? Research, research shows that malnutrition severely hinders cognitive development in children, insofar as people in lower class lack the money to eat health healthfully and buy as good as an education as those in the upper class. So having a lower you know less education not not the same resources yeah it, it affects your intelligence but they're at a clear disadvantage he says nor are they helped by the frequent necessity of parents to work two or more jobs intellectually uh you know they're not stimulating jobs or by the unhealthy unnurturing home environment that may result from this fact and other stresses of low income life moreover with a low income one likely has less easy access to books high culture ver varied social experiences other intellectual stimulation than the middle class or well off which may cause innate potential uh, kind of like uh, uh, you're stuck okay uh, uh, atrophy living in a crime ridden neighborhoods or culturally barren trailer parks or low income suburbs may foster certain types of intelligence but rarely the kinds vulgarized by mainstream mainstream society i'll return to the working class in a moment he says for despite all these disadvantages in some respects its members show more intelligence meaning the the low income people show more intelligence the intelligence of being able to see yourself in the other person's place you can if you're because they're poor they feel the suffering of the poor right? Whereas the rich, they don't feel the suffering of the poor. Why? This is what we're going to talk about. I'll return to the working class in a moment, for despite all these disadvantages, in some respects, its members show more intelligence than their supposed betters. What I'm most intrigued and disturbed by is not low IQ, but rather three very common deficiencies. Number one, a lack of empathy. 
a lack of self-insight, and deficiency in, deficiency in the capacity to reason or to think abstractly. These deficiencies seem to spread fairly evenly throughout the U.S. population and aren't obviously distributed by class, with partial exception of the empathy deficit, meaning poor people can understand poverty, okay, which appears to be more common among the wealthy than the middle class or the poor, meaning the rich people, they, don't, they can't relate to the poor. They don't have any empathy. They lose the empathy. And when they lose the empathy, then they, and, and they're thinking ideas like Milton Friedman, that I own myself, it's my money, it's my property, it's my hard work, why should I, why should I be taxed? Then all sorts of things are done and have been done, okay, to curtail the freedoms of the individuals, which we'll come to in a second. So, then he says, with the partial exception of empathy deficit, which appears to be more common among, uh, the deficit of empathy is more common among the wealthy than the middle class or poor. This particular finding is an example of science confirming common sense. People are influenced by their social environment, which to a great extent amounts to their class position. Since one's economic resources largely determine where one lives, whom one, whom, whom one interacts with, what kind of institution one identifies with, etc., or from a different perspective, in order to rise in the ranks and become wealthy, one is often compelled to act in a generally selfish and greedy way. However you look at it, therefore the wealthy face many pressures to develop unsympathetic listen to this, are often compelled to act in a generally selfish and greedy way. However you look at it, therefore, the wealthy face many pressures to develop unsympathetic character uh, traits like ignorance, greed, and lack of empathy. The human tendency to rationalize everything one does and justifies social existence further tempts the rich into adopting social Darwinistic ideologies such that they may have contempt rather than compassion for the poor. Then he writes, let me just do this very quickly. Conversely, it is well known that the poor are far more, far more generous than their betters. They are, give relatively more to charity than the rich do. Studies have shown that they are more attuned to the need of others and more committed generally to the values of egalitarianism, meaning everyone is equal. No surprise there. Knowing hardship firsthand, the poor have more compassion for suffering. They may, may well live in a more communal environment than the rich, which itself fosters mutual understanding and concern, especially since this, ethnic, this ethic of mutualism helps the poor survive. If empathy can be called a kind of intelligence and emotional understanding of others, which it is, and there's a book, uh, you know, uh, by David Goldman uh, on, on the EQ, you know, emotional intelligence instead of IQ. An emotional understanding of others, an ability to imagine oneself in their shoes and see the world through their eyes, then it would seem that in this respect, poor are more intelligent than the socially esteemed. Now, why does this matter? This matters because of this reason. Because when you understand others, this type of intelligence helps you grow. When you don't understand others and where they are coming from, and you cannot have empathy for them, you don't have empathy, you don't understand where they're coming from, what their perspective is, when you lose that, then you're stuck in your own box. If I'm arrogant and someone gives me advice, then I'm stuck in my own box. But if I have empathy, if I have compassion, I can understand where somebody is coming from, then I will grow because of that. And so you have a bunch of stupid people who lack empathy that are ruling the world. They don't even understand you and they don't want to understand you and they can't understand you. This is called summum bukmun umyun fahum la Okay? 
And so what have these rich people done? These rich people have tried to create an environment that in the name of capitalism is taking away the rights of the individuals. The economist Rob Larson has performed an important service, therefore, in publishing his new book, Capitalism versus Freedom, The Road, the Road to Serfdom. The more, the more so because the book's lucidity and brevity should win a far for it wide readership. In five chapters, Larson systematically demolishes okay, uh, the ideas of Milton Friedman and Frederick Hayek. Who, it, who in the process also dispatching those other patron saints of right wing, like uh, these people, okay? Even the book's title is highly effective. The message, Capitalism versus Freedom, should be trump trumpeted from the hills since it challenges one of the reins of dogmas of our society, which is that capitalism leads to freedom. No, it's in fact, when a few people are rich, and then they're controlling the government and they're affecting the government, then that raw and pure capitalism is not something that leads to freedom. It leads to something opposite of freedom, which we'll talk about very, okay? Liberals and leftists themselves sometimes buy into the view that capitalism promotes freedom, arguing only that socialist equality and justice are more important than capitalist capitalist freedom. But this is a false framing of the issue. The fact is that socialism, socialism, which is to say workers, democratic control of the economy, not only means greater equality and justice than capitalism, but also greater freedom for at least 99%. It is freedom, after all, that has inspired anarchists, even Marxists, including Marx himself. Larson begins with a brief discussion of two concepts. Now, there are two types of freedoms. Freedom to do something and freedom from something. Just keep this in mind, okay? So, two concepts of freedom, negative and positive. Crudely speaking, negative freedom means the absence of external constraints. Nothing is outside should not stop me from, or nothing is forcing me from the outside. I have freedom from them, okay? Crudely speaking, negative freedom means the absence of external constraint or a power that can force you to act in particular ways. Positive freedom is the ability or opportunity actually to realize purposes and wishes to control your destiny. So positive freedom is you can move in the direction you want to in life. Negative freedom is somebody is coming to me and forcing me to do something I don't want to do. Basically, negative freedom is what Milton Friedman called freedom. Okay. Uh, control your d destiny, so to speak. It involves having the means to satisfy desires. This is positive freedom. As when you have as a, as a means to uh, eat when you're hungry and adequate clothing, shelter, and have adequate s sanitation. Positive freedom can be thought of as freedom to, whereas neg negative freedom is freedom from. Classical liberals like John Stuart Mill and, and modern conservatives like Friedman and Hayek are more concerned with negative freedom. So the rich people are more interested in negative freedom. Okay, just keep this in mind. Which explains their desire for a minimal state. Because they don't want somebody telling them what to do, since they're rich. They want a small government. Socialists are concerned also with positive freedom, sometime, sometimes believing that the stronger state can help ensure such freedom for the majority of the people. So that's socialists. Okay. Friedman and Hayek argued that free, free market capitalism with minimal intervention by the state is the surest great guarantee to negative liberty. Larson's books is devoted mainly to refuting this belief, which is widely held across the political spectrum. But it also defends a less controversial claim that capitalism is incompatible with widespread positive liberty too. Capitalism, Larson writes, withholds opportunities to enjoy freedom required by positive view of freedom and also encourages growth of economic power. Adver the adversary of liberty in the negative view of freedom. Okay. That concentrations of economic power in themselves threaten negative liberty might be challenged, but this is a weak argument, among other reasons, because it is clear that the centers of economic power will tend to dominate and manipulate the state to their own interests. Like one example, very interesting is, 
that, you know, why jobs overseas? Why not jobs for Americans in America? Well, because it's cheaper for the companies. That's why, you know. So the companies are able to push their wealth and, uh, you know, give donations to politicians and affect the government in a way that will keep the government from coming in between them and their desires. And so this is the, uh, this is, they want to keep the government away from affecting their freedom and what they want to do, which in result affects what is called positive freedom is from helping the individual, the masses from actually achieving their goals because the big businesses are going to do things in their interest, which is going to go against the majority. They'll construct coerc coerc coercive apparatus to sub subordinate others to their power, which will itself enable further accumulation of powers, etc., until finally the society is ruled by an oligarchy. Okay, just a few people and few families that are rich. Thus, from pure capitalism, you get an oligarchy, which is the power to coerce. Okay, so uh, let's now continue because I, I could talk about this more, but I will now uh, share with you something very interesting. Okay, so who are people that are for five libertarians, welfare kings who got rich off the government but want to destroy? So five people that are billionaires. Okay, we're only going to talk about touch on two of them today. Five people are billionaires, but they want to make gov the government, who use the government to become rich, and now want to limit the government. See, that is your ego at play. Okay? So we're going to look at uh, number four. Elon Musk. Now, those of you who know, the, in the, he's an inventor, right? But Elon Musk used, what, the government to subsidize and to pay for his company to make some of the inventions that he was making. Okay, so Elon Musk himself is one of those people that's for small government because he doesn't want the government to come in between him. He's 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 one of the rich ones. And Jeff Zo uh, Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, right? He also, right? He wants to do away with government, even though he used the government to get. To where he is today so this is what happens when you become rich then you lose your ability to empathize with the poor and the rich become richer and richer and when they become super rich then they are able to pressure the government and individuals to do what they want by which people ultimately lose their freedoms and so therefore you have now the the economic collapse that is beginning to take place in the world, which is another subject which I'm not going to go into right now. Libertarians are even whiter and wealthier than GOP. Okay, so the, the, the right wing is ultimately controlled by the libertarians. These people who believe I own myself and government, no one should tell me what to do with my money, my labor, my hard work, it's mine. Okay, just like the man in the garden of Stulkahaf, right? So somebody says, why would someone who's libertarian, who, who's, why, why would someone who is not rich be a libertarian? And this is because they're brainwashed. A more honest name for libertarianism, money and powerism. Okay. So these are the, some of the ideas that are taught in what? in the higher studies, which people are then told to think about these things and these ideas. And so just for, uh, you know, just maybe uh, just for a few more minutes, let's watch what happens next. And now he's going to have the students debate each other, so on and so forth. In fact, you know what? I think this is enough, inshallah ta'ala. Now, I want to know if you're more interested in more of these, uh, the, these types of talks, because I would really like to take uh, ideas of the modern times and really put them under the microscope and uh, and 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 put them under the microscope of Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet I think it's a very because you know there are two battles there's a battle of land which is for the Khilafah for the Islamic State and actually there are three battles but the first battle is one battle is the battle of land okay which is the Khilafah and the second battle is the battle of ideas Islam the ideas of Islam in, in, in this market of ideas, the, there's the ideas of Islam and Islam, 
needs to show what are its ideas, right? And part of that is to show that what the other ideas that are out there, they're not as strong as we may have thought that they were 30, 40 years ago. They're, they're, they're not working out. They're not, they don't have a good result so far. And the third is the, uh, the uh, experiential, which I'm not going to go into right now, but which has to do with our Iman, basically. Okay, so Jazakumullah Khairan, please subscribe, please share, and tell me what you thought of this topic. Jazakumullah Khairan, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Make sure to subscribe today and make sure you like and make sure you leave your comments and ideas. Jazakumullah Khairan, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi أشهد أن لا